Hi, I'm Reggie Ponder, The Real Critic, and this is The Real Critic Roundtable, where African-American critics come to discuss, debate, and have some fun. Man, I got some new peoples, I got some old peoples, I got some old, old peoples. I'm so happy to have folks here today. So first, I'm going to start off with Mercedes Springer from uh, SheetCritiques.com. Uh, and you can check her out at Sheet Critiques. And um, Mercedes, she's been avoiding us. We used to have her on like on a major way and all that type of stuff, but we got her back. She's back in the house. Hey, Mercedes, tell us um, what you've been working on. Give us. I, I, I know you're doing some stuff, so just just get just spill the tea, girl. Well, first, I would never avoid any of you. Thank you for having me again already. I love having these conversations with you guys. Um, yes, I have some awesome reality shows coming out next week. Uh, the Challenge, MTV's. 37th season coming out. I got to be a part of that out in Croatia, so I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm I'm looking forward to this conversation. I got a lot to say. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, I heard that. So then I was able to pull in Kim Ford. So this is for, from, she's from, uh, uh, you can check her stuff out at IamKimFord.com. And and let me, let me just tell you the beef that I have with Kim Ford. So this is my beef. I'm like, hey, Kim, we gonna do this next week? She's like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. And then she's not looking at my email. Now, what is up with what's up with, what's up with that? So I didn't even see the first of all, I'm used to get the calendar invite. So let's start there. I'm like, what's on the calendar? So it ain't happened. So it wasn't on purpose. Oh, oh, do you see, do you see it? Sis, so she going no, in. She you know, going in. No. The invite. I'm like, oh, I realized it. And plus, I never saw even saw the email. I'm I just like, bothered you, oh. Kim. I just bother Please you. Please text me because that's this, this, no. this, this is this is my way of showing love. Just bother me. <laughs> I'm really happy to have you have you uh, join us. And Kim, talk about what uh, uh, your projects, some some of the stuff you're working on. Uh, let my people know where they can find you and all that type of stuff. Okay, right now, currently, real time, I'm working on my post for Jennifer Hudson. I interviewed her um, a few days ago for Respect, that will be out in theaters August 13th. So um, if you haven't seen it, well. Probably most people have not seen it, but I went to the screening. It's absolutely amazing. Marlon Wayans is outstanding. Of course, Jay Hood sings her face off. So that's what I'm very knee deep in is getting all that content up for that. And it can all be found on my blog at IamKimFord.com. Yeah, if you don't know, you better ask somebody. And then I'm bringing back my friend who, who's who been here like every week. I think she had missed one week and stuff. She tried to go on vacation on me. But that's all right. That's all right because... She introduced me to Ted Lasso, and she and um, and KB introduced me to Ted Lasso. So I'm I, I am forever grateful because that is a funny show. Let me welcome to to the show again, Katia Woods. You can find her at CoupleSoulShow.com, but you can also find her at the Philadelphia Tribune. She used to write like music and movies, but she's writing about everything. Katia, tell us what you got working right now. Uh, I have a story dropping on a uh, Black Star Film Festival if you're in the Philly area. That's going on right now. It started on Wednesday. And um, they're showing a new extension of Eyes on the Prize and for HBO. So they're premiering that as a closing film. So if you're in the Philly area, if you're feeling comfortable, go support that. And they're also doing online. You can do it online if you don't want to be mixing with people. Um, and I understand that. Uh, so I have a story on that. I like everybody else. I'm working on my um, respect review. Got to trim that bad boy down because, you know, print is different. <laughs> and, um, you know, just getting and covering Fantasia, Black Star, you know, trying to do it all at the same time, get my get ready to send my daughter back to college. So that's what's uh -huh. I yeah, uh, you, you sound like you're a little bit busy over there, and that's really good. All right, so we're going to get into it. We have three movies that we're going to talk about, and we're going to start off with the one that Katya made me watch first because I was not aware of it, and uh, she always does this to me and says, Reggie, have you seen? You haven't seen? You don't know about? And that's the movie Nine Days. Uh, Katya, tell us what this one's about, and tell us what you think about it. Well, it's a beautiful film. I first saw it at, at, at Sundance. And shout out to my Brazilian brother, Edson Oso, who is the director. And it really is about these different souls. And and, and Winston Duke plays um, 
the the soul keeper for lack of a better word and he lost one of the the the, the angels the spirits and he's got to find a replacement so he's interviewing all of these people to be the most you know who will be the most suitable candidate and as he's getting to know them as he's giving them scenario he starts dwindling down and the way that you know they they get rid of people is not by killing them he asks them for what is their favorite memory or what is something that they really really like he creates it and then they kind of drift off to the abyss the thing that i love about this movie is it's something we haven't seen before and it gives us a different perspective of the afterlife or here and guardian angels and for me like you can tell that adds in a lot of our culture was really in this film because faith is huge. Religion is a huge part of Brazilian life. It's, I mean, more Roman Catholic than Baptist and um, spirituality, family, good versus evil. And there's a very interesting twist because I asked him why did he make the choice to have the person that, his, that Winston ultimately picked over someone else. And he said that she was too good. And in order to operate in the real world, in our world, you need to have a little bit of evil. You need to have a little bit of edge. And her spirit was too positive and too optimistic. And you can see that in, 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 in her character played beautifully by Zazie. And I think for me personally, this is one of the best parts for her. You get to see range, you get to see something different. And I loved Winston in this, and he showed that he's very much a leading man. So, so I, I take it from what you're saying is that you like this one, uh, Kim. Uh, what you think about this one, Kim? Well, I have not seen it, um, but it sounds. Um, I think it sounds great. It sounds like something that we all need to to tune into. So, I'm looking forward to seeing it. So, I can't, you know, yeah, that yeah, ab before. absolutely. I <laughs> Absolutely. Mercedes. Yeah. You know, I really, what I really, really enjoyed about the film, like the takeaway for me was that I love that it wasn't religious. It was spiritual, you know? And I think that that's where a lot of people are kind of migrating to now, you know, where we got to have a connection more so than following these rules that are just mandated and dictating our lives. But you, you have a connection with the you know, the spirit of God and what that means to you. And I really like to Katia's point, it felt very like, um, yes, like you have guardian angels kind of watching over your every step. People who have selected you here for a purpose, to fulfill a purpose and to go out into the world because they saw something in you. So I like, those are the things that I took away from the film. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. It was original. I've never seen anything like this. It's not your faith-based film. It's not, you know, drilling religion or beating you upside the head with the Bible. It's very, you know, it makes you question. It doesn't give you any answers, but it gives you a lot of, um, you know, come to your own conclusions. And what I really liked is that he didn't jump all over the place using a lot of different, um, uh, you know, areas. He stayed focal in this one house. This, you know, it, most of the film takes place at this one house. And uh, I don't know, it was a beautiful, Beautiful story, beautifully told. I, I'm I'm in love with this film. This is definitely it's up there for me this year. So it's really interesting. So so I I agree with you guys that this is a beautiful film. It it questions a lot of things. It questions you know what choices we make, uh, what makes us alive, uh, uh, and what makes us not alive. What makes us not do the stuff that we really should be doing in our lives to be alive. What what it, it, it talks about fear. It talks about a lot of things here. There's two things for me, though, that, that's competing against each other. And it's the one thing, which is mystery. There's a mystery about this whole thing all throughout, which makes yeah. it intriguing. But it also makes it a little hard to follow in, in some places, in, in my opinion, is that you're like, OK, so so what are they doing? So what's happening? And and. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I want to put that out there because I think that for people watching this, it's not as linear as people might want might want it to be. So if you're just a linear thinking, you're going to have to suspend suspend that for a moment to be able to to take this ride. And it's a beautiful ride, but it's just not 
as straightforward as as some people might think. And I see you have a, a thought on this, uh, Mercedes. Yeah, because I feel like, because some people might take it as holes or they're not telling you every single thing, but I think that's the beauty and the art of it. You know, like it's the art of, it's up for interpretation. What does that mean to you? Because you can't, you know, you can't tell people how to feel about faith necessarily. And I think that's, I think that's what he was trying to do. And I was going to ask Katya because I know you might have a chance to speak with them. Um, was there a reason why they didn't start with, well, I guess you can't start with newborns necessarily, but they brought them in as adults. You know what I mean? I thought that was interesting. And then they would go in as newborns. The idea is that you're in this in between, you're not fully a person yet. So you're in this in between stage. And um, it was more palatable to understand why certain people didn't fit the job description. That was the thought process. At least that's what I'm getting from when he said it. The other thing is, is so much of who we are as Brazilian people is so in this film. And it really is like our, our optimism in spite of horrendous things that are going on. Uh, the thing that we are so ingrained with us, faith and, 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 and Catholicism is a huge thing that we're all brought up with. But as adults, we are steering away from the Catholicism part because we're marching towards the faith part. And he really specifically said, I was raised Roman Catholic and I was like, I was too. And, but I'm not a practicing Catholic but I like the spirituality and the centerness, which is something I think a lot of us are struggling with. And then the other part is he didn't want people to focus on the dying part. That's why he didn't show it. Like he could have just been like, oh, boom, you dropped that, right? And it would have been infinitive. But he wanted us to, to talk and focus more about the complexities of living, how to navigate the world, why a person, like, you know, if, I love that. I love that content. I was watching it, and I really thought I had figured out who he was going to choose. And at the end, I had to sit there and think for a minute, why wouldn't he choose her? And then hearing him talk about it, I was like, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, so I really like this thing that you talk about as you as you talk about the complexities because it really is complex. And the thing that I love about this film is that it asks a lot of questions. And and you said this, Mercedes. It doesn't necessarily give you all the answers. But what it does say to me is that, you know how people say, I wouldn't do that. If I was in this situation, that is that it's, it really tells you, you don't know what you're going to do. Yeah. Until you're really in that situation. Is that, that we always like, well, why does she do that? Or why does she do that? You don't know. You, you just don't know. I think it is a beautiful film. I think that uh, a do uh, the, at the end, that 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 ending scene is so powerful and so f phenomenal. Um, but obviously, we don't want to give away a lot. So I'm saying this one. So watch it, Mercedes. What are you saying? Absolutely, watch it. Yeah. Uh, I I don't even need to ask Katya. Katya, what you saying? Absolutely. All right. Well, well I can't wait to watch it because I love anything faith based. So. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. We got Kim. We got Kim on board. What you say, Katya? I said it holds up because I literally saw it a year. And before I rewatched it, I could still tell you the things that I saw. Like I completely remembered this film. We all know there are certain things we saw a year ago and then you rewatch, you were like, this was in the film? It's right. like, like your memory erased it, but this film really stayed with me. So that's, I think, another um, high tale. So absolutely a watcher for me. Yeah. Can I say too, I think it would do, I think it would translate really well on stage. Because it's oh. very dialogue. I, I could so see this for the stage, for a stage, but that would be amazing. The the production value in this was fantastic. How how they did the the that moment for each one of those people. And there's one with the bicycle, again, not to try to give up that, that is just absolutely fabulous. Uh, I, I I definitely think that this is this is a watch it. And uh uh Katya, you I don't want to stay on this too long. Uh, but but you are always give credit to the actors and you only talked about two of them so if you could just mention some of the other actors in, in this uh i'd appreciate it because you you're like we can't forget this person we can't forget uh, this person. De who plays like his consultant tony hale who really is a good i don't want to give it away 
Like he's trying to be what he thinks the job requires. And that is kind of like what puts him in a different category. I, I'm just so glad to see that. I just want to mention Tony because we are so used to him being kiki ha ha, being the funny guy. And in this, he's not. He's playing straight and serious all the way through. Yeah, well, thank you. All right, that's it. All right, so now we're going to move on from something that's real adult like, because that was for adults. I mean, you you have to go get through that as we're going to move to something that, that younger people might like. And so we're going to go to Vivo. So who's going to bring that one in for me? Talk, tell me what Vivo is about and tell me what you think about it. I got you on Vivo. Okay, so Vivo is about a music loving, it's a Kikachu. Kikachu, Kikachu. Uh, he embarks on a journey of a lifetime to fulfill his destiny and deliver a love song for an old friend. Uh, it stars Lin Manuel Miranda, Zoe Saldana. We got Gloria Estefan in this. Brian Tyree Henry, Nicole Byers. So many, so an all star studded cast sounds like. Um, Vivo for me was a cute film. And I guess it's I guess it's piggybacking all as well on nine days because it does have a little bit of death element into it, which I think a lot of animations are doing now for children to kind of understand, which is a, a new spin on animation. Um, overall, I enjoyed it. At times, I thought it wasn't made for children because it was a little hard to follow. So for me, um, I enjoyed the, the music was okay. I enjoyed it more towards the end. It was just, it was okay film for me. I I wasn't in love with Vivo. I love the adventure of the little girl and him kind of going off on a tangent and going through the woods. That I was, I would love to see a spinoff of just Vivo and the little girl Gabby <laughs> going on adventures. That's the story for me. That's the animation I think I would like to follow. This one was okay. It was okay. All right, all right Kim. Once again, you've caught me in a film I have not seen yet. Okay, <laughs> I you didn't deep. see this one, so so that's no, all right. That's I, okay. That's I all right. But but so so it's interesting, Mercedes, that you would say that uh, it was okay because there were parts of it that I liked, and then there were parts of it that felt Lin Manuel Miranda, mm -hmm. and 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 I, I kept saying to myself, maybe just because I'm I've seen his work that some of it just seems very him. And I wanted something, maybe a little bit different. So the opening scene you see, there's this rap scene. I, I don't know that I need that per se, but, what right. I, but, but there were a number of things that I did like about this, is that it was about people from Cuba and they used people from Cuba. Hallelujah. We we criticized him about not having uh, an array of colors of of, uh, of hues of people. In this in this film, he had an array of colors of hues of people. Um, the music I felt was on point in terms of the Cuban music. And then they did something good to try to. They had some pop. They had some rap. They tried to fill it in. So I think as an effort, they did a good job. The the end really did kind of kind of started to get me. I had a little tear running over here. Ooh, don't tell anybody, Kim. Um, I had a little tear over there and I was like, oh man. I think they did a solid job, but but I didn't, I, I do agree with you about this thing about, um, is it really for young kids? Because the, the whole death thing. So I think it's probably in a, in a, in a tween little, pocket I, I don't know i don't know if this is like for my five-year-old to to go and check out but i thought that they did a, a overall good uh, overall good job uh with it uh but it did feel a little miranda ish if if you will and i'm not saying that's a bad thing maybe it's just for me i wanted just something a little bit different but i i love gloria stefan at all times so uh so uh i'm glad to see it what do you think about this one katya i really enjoyed it i thought it was so great that they and um the guy who played the older gentleman that they got from the marcos gonzalez and if you know anything about cuban music he is a part of the dynamic uh buena vista social club if there's a whole documentary out there that shows you that history with a concert and everything uh, you might be able to catch some glimpses on youtube it doesn't get more cuban than buena vista social club and 
to have him in there to influence the music, to balance out be, what, what, what um, Lin-Manuel does is super important. Not to mention is his voice translates so beautifully for oh. animation, like the way he speaks is very musical. Um, I like that Lin-Manuel Pikachu was kind of like a backseat when we got to Gabby. I love that this little girl is like, I have no interest in being part of the group. As much <laughs> as her mother was trying to get her to be this girl, she's like, I want no parts of it, mm -hmm. right? And I love that she was comfortable in not wanting to be a part of the group because I think that's a really strong message. We send so much to kids, you have to belong, make these types of friends, join this club, and Gabby was having none of it. Mm -hmm. I love like the song, The Beat of My Own Drum, which reinforces that. There's a remix out there with Missy Elliott. I like and that too. I like that, that too. Thing. And she, I love the animation. Sony has got done a really good job of, um, this was previously Sony and then Netflix bought it, uh, with the hair, it's like punkyish, her little vest, uh, the facial expressions. I wonder like if we get to see that from the little girl, cause she was like, her mom would be like, you're gonna sound, she'd be like, making the eyes and all that, which is typical. Oh, you know, when you try to get your kid to do something, like we pay for these lessons and you're gonna do that. Uh, Gloria Estefan in animation doesn't go wrong. Like they got her eyebrows, which you know, and you look at, like you could see Gloria in there. Uh, is it perfect? No, but it's fun. And I think, again, we talked about this. It's perfect for the environment that we're in. If you wanna have family movie night, everybody gets their own snack. You can sit around the couch. You can do something outdoors if you want to really go in and gather the family to see it. I agree with with you guys. It's for little kids, but if we're talking grade school, and again, if you have kids of different ages, it's very hard to find something that everybody likes. We know it's hard to get an activity where you can be like, "Listen, we're gonna do this activity. You don't pay for this park, and we're gonna go on these rides." Right? This is one of those things where because it's on Netflix, you can just hit play and the kids can see it and they can sing along to the music. I have a feeling we're gonna be singing along to this music because I had the songs in my head. And I do like that they incorporated and didn't let Lynn's musical voice be mm -hmm. the dominant voice. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy about, I am very happy about that too. So this this is a, this is a watch it for me. I, I, I didn't love it. I, I totally didn't hate it. I think it's it's absolutely serviceable. It's a it's a fun movie. So I'm saying as a watch it. Uh Katya, you what are you saying? I definitely think get your kids together and then you know start singing along to the beat of your own drum. It's it's gonna stay in your head. I'm sorry, it is. <laughs> All right, uh Mercedes, you got the last word on this one. I'm gonna say check it out, but I'm more so looking forward to this spinoff that I know this little girl Gabby is gonna get. I want to see her and Vivo go on some adventures. That's what I want to see. All right, all right. Well, well, Netflix. I hope you're listening because uh, <laughs> I guess you got a new movie, a new series to 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 do. All right. So now I'm for sure we got Kim in the house this time because Kim is gonna bring in the Suicide Squad. She's gonna tell us what this one is about. And tell her, tell us how she thinks, what she thinks about this one. Oh, uh, Kim, bring okay, it, on, so bring it on home, girl. So, Suicide Squad is one that I know that most people like. At least the ones I've talked to, they absolutely love the whole franchise. So, it's an American superhero film based um, on the DC Comics um, Suicide Squad, and it's produced by Warner Brothers. And it was released overseas July 30th, but it was released in the U.S. actually on yesterday and in theaters and on HBO Max. So it's the, um, the 10th installment of the DC Extended Universe and it's written and directed by James Gunn. Now this, what I am most excited about is anytime we get to see Idris Elba on camera, it's a yes, 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 and a yes for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go into a little deeper of who the cast is. We have Margot Robbie, obviously Idris Elba, John Cena, who is also great to look at on camera. Um, Joel Kinnaman. <laughs> this is why we watch movies. <laughs> I don't discriminate now. I don't discriminate. So, <laughs> I welcome all all men. I'll put it that way. Um, Joel Kinnaman, Sylvester Stallone, and the wonderful, great Viola Davis. I know she's going to um, deliver in it. So, in the film, this is a little bit what it's about. Um, it's, a, it's when a task force of convicts, that's where they are, convicts, are sent to destroy a Nazi-era lab to encounter the giant alien um, Starro. So 
I'm looking forward to fully watching it on HBO Max today. But even in, in the one in, that released in 2016, they had an amazing press run. I went to the screening there. They always give out nice little, you know, suicide squad. Uh, squad. I still have the, the sequin socks that they gave out to us. So Warner Brothers always goes out real hard. And of course, when they give the, the press lovely trinkets, I just go even harder for it because who doesn't love free stuff? But uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, to all, right, all right. All right. Uh, Ka Katya. I enjoyed this. It's not a sequel. It's a, it's the same ideology. Only one of the superheroes is returning. It's the Colonel, but everybody else is, is new in terms of the, I call them anti-heroes and Viola is like the returning, but everybody else is new. I liked I loved Idris in this, you know, because he's just like, oh, let's just do this. And he just is like, what? How am I here? Do you know what I mean? Uh, shout out to Pete Davidson, who said, you know, I'm, I'm going to get this check. <laughs> check. And I'm not mad at him. Uh, I thought it was also that Sylvester Stallone, the, who does not take himself as serious as some people think he does, was willing to play shark. You know what I mean? That who is just the whole idea of it is super, super absurd. Right. <laughs> Dark and shorts, right? And of course, um, Margot Robbie is as Harley Quinn, which is you know the the hair and makeup, the way they build this character and bring her to life is so vital for her, and just the way she leans into her craziness um i really really enjoyed is the story all over the place yes but we know this we don't watch this for for deep storytelling i will say this this film uh, my daughter and i went to the screening together uh my daughter was like this is very gory and very violent yes so you may want to like as a parent want to peek at it uh, on hbo max a little bit before you bring your younger kids because they may end up you know sleeping in your bed having nightmares so i definitely caution if you have younger kids that scare easily this is not the jam for them but i thought this was fun i thought this was great and this is what i call a real summer movie this is yeah. what we want escapism fun we're not there for the plot we want to see our, our our movie stars and just escape for for a couple hours. So it's really it's really interesting. Is that um, this this movie? They don't even attempt to fuse reality or, or with fantasy. They just go way out there, out on the limb, and it the 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 plot really doesn't matter. And and I wrote in my thing that this 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 movie was really about. It not making sense for people, people who want to see a comic book movie that just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Do they need these this group of people to go get what they supposed to go get? Now nah, they could just bomb the place and do whatever they. They just use this as an excuse so we can see these super villains at work, and the excuse works. There's three things that work for me in this film. The first is that there's plenty of action. If you're looking for action, you want something blown up, disintegrated, tore up. You're going to see it there, and it's not going to, it's not tied to anything. To, to Katya's point, though, it is really violent, and there's only so many ways you can kill some people, so it does get a little bit repetitive, but not too much so. Uh, but, but, but that's good. They also give each character their shine. They don't just, they don't just have them there. Each character gets their shine, and this is not a spoiler alert. Some of them die. That's why it's called Suicide Squad. You know, hello? And then the other thing, it looks so good on the big screen. I'm not trying to tell y'all to go out there because I know it's, it's getting tougher and tougher uh, in terms of our environment with, with COVID. I'm not telling you, but it, de it definitely looks good on the big screen. So those are things that I like about it. I think that the fact that it didn't take itself serious is great. Now, the things that I didn't like is that did I care about all the characters and the plot and the miss no and 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 but the artistry of this is actually really good they put this together from an artistic perspective and i believe that this franchise just got itself um 
uh, made it where it won't die, that it will multiply. Whether it be another nice. and another and another. What you got, Mercedes? Y'all being way too nice for me. I feel like I'm, I know Sean ain't here, but he would definitely label this some hot garbage if he was. I mean, I honestly, I this was. I understand even the escapism of it. I'm like, you know, okay, I can hear that part. You do want to sometimes you don't want to think, you don't want a full story, but this was a waste of time for me. This was an absolute waste of time for me. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I, I will say who carried the film for me. I enjoyed watching Viola in this in her role. I really enjoyed her in this role. I enjoyed Idris Elba. I enjoyed uh, Margot Robbie. I enjoyed the fact that even there was a scene. I don't want to give it away, but there was a scene. Margot Robbie needs to be saved and she saves herself. You know, so she does carry herself even as a woman in this film who doesn't, you know, I can handle my own or, you know, I'm my own superhero. I really enjoyed that aspect of her story in this film. Um, it, I just I have a hard time telling people to go see it when I felt like I was sitting there like, OK, what time is this going to be over? OK, this is no, ridiculous. So, so, so for you, for you, this was not only. Uh, you were not only disinterested, but but that they didn't connect any kind of dots for you for this one. No, it it wasn't. I have a hard time just telling other people to go check it out, knowing that I sat there like, what the hell am I watching? Like, what the really is going on? I, I will counter to that. We as critics do this. And I always tell people just because something wasn't my didn't float my boat doesn't mean it won't work for you. I'm me, I'm Katya, I have my perspective. There are things that I love that I know is gonna be me and four other people, but I'm gonna die on that hill because I had a good time watching it. I do think that you can, you're perfectly within your right as you should be. If it didn't work for you, it didn't work for you. But I would still say to somebody, especially seeing that you don't necessarily have to go to the theater to spend the money to see it if you have HBO Max. Again, I'm not telling you to spend mm -hmm. the $14.99. If you got it, oh, you got a homeboy, maybe you you can give him $7 for the month and go see it like that. <laughs> <laughs> I would, um, you know how our people do? It has an audience. I know. I would, say, I would still say, go make up your own mind because all the things that may not work for you. And again, there's a gazillion films that people love. And I'd be like, did we watch the same? Like, I didn't love Jungle Cruise. Just so we're on the same page. Like, I had a lot of problems with Jungle Cruise. But I'm still like, you know what? If if you love The Rock and you love Emily Blunt, go be great. It yeah, just I know they have yeah, a yeah, hardcore yeah. fan base. They have a hardcore fan base. They have an audience. I, you know, I've seen the ones previously too, so I know that this is what this is just what this movie is gonna do. Gonna it's it's not my cup. If you are a fan of this franchise, you want. I, I'm sure they the audience will serve. You know, it, the audience will be served. So I, I really understand where you're coming from, though, Mercedes, because and I understand where where Conti is coming from is because this is not, it's not like I love this movie. This is not a movie that that Reggie would be like, oh, man, I got to go go check out. But I think from a artistry perspective that they did what they needed to do is that that they they made it where there will be another and people who like this will enjoy it because they didn't take themselves seriously on it. I think the first, the, the other su the Suicide Squad was probably a little bit more serious. And this one, they didn't take themselves serious and kind of went out there. So I'm going to say that it's a watch it. Uh, you're going to say it is hot garbage and you're not going to check this one out, uh, Mercedes? <laughs> I'm going to say uh, it was hot garbage and save your two hours. <laughs> All right. And, and, and the Katya. No, it's fun. It's silly. Just don't go in there having any expectations. You get to see a shark in shorts. All right. Well, we, that, that's it. What about you? We forgot to ask Kim. Kim, Kim. watch it for you. Kim. Yeah, I would say if you love DC films, because there are some hardcore DC films that's going to go see whatever they make, regardless of what it is, go yeah. see it. If you love the gory, if that's your thing, go see it. It's not my thing, but if that's where you want to see all that eight, all the guts and all that, go see it. And obviously, if you love some good man candy, go see it. You know, I knew so Kim was going. I would say, depending upon what your you know your thing is, that's what I would say to someone that, um, that's on the fence. If that's what you like, then this might be your film. There, there you go. Well, you got it. You got it from the critics. All right, 
So now we're going to move into our section of hot topics. And, um, and, and, and when we do that, I put you guys on the timer because I have learned that my friend from the Philadelphia Tribune has got a whole lot of stuff to say. So we're going to go to the timer and we're going to go through these things. As, as, as he got you on the timer now. Right. <laughs> Oh wow! So I, said, I was good. I've made the time. So no, no, nah, nah, I'm just bother, I, I'm just bothering her because she's always on the show every week. So, so don't <laughs> don't, don't 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 worry about it, y'all. Um, so, the first topic that I want to talk to you guys about is this. I'm trying to look on my um. Oh, here we are. The first one is news, 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 and it is about the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. So we we have found out that it gets some new showrunners and they're going to take a slightly different direction. Do we care? Does it matter? Uh, I'll start off with you first, Kim. What do you think about this one? Oh, we absolutely care because it is the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. It's a classic um, in TV history. So to see, and obviously it has Will's backing and blessing, but to see the, the spin that they have on it, I'm excited to see what it is. You know, obviously when it aired in the 90s, it was more of a comedy. From what I understand, it's not going to be so much of a comedy. Um, so I'm looking forward to see what type of spin on it to see if the new millennials connect with it, connect with it the way that we connected with it in the 90s. OK, Mercedes. Um, you know, and I read this article that you sent over to Reggie, because when I read it, I'm thinking, OK, so there's trouble in paradise. You know, it sounds like they had this great idea. Let's do this. You know, the trailer that the the young man made, they jumped on it. Let's do it. Clearly something wasn't working out. The fact that they have to bring in now new showrunners, uh, we're going to go in a different direction. We're pushing the show back. It won't be off to 2022. That to me smells like trouble in paradise. Like, okay, something is, wasn't cooking right in the kitchen. We got to go back in. They're hiring new people and getting rid of people. That says a lot. That smells like trouble to me. And I hope they're not jacking up something that we love so near and dear. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you, Kim. I do care. And I agree with Mercedes because I believe that something's wrong in paradise is that when you hire somebody to replace somebody, then we hire somebody to replace the somebody that you hired to replace the somebody. We got some issues. And if you if you look at it, it looks like some, there's some internal stuff going on here. So I I like the direction that that they started off with. So I'm very, very curious as to how this might play out. Katya. I mean, that happens. I'd rather them do it now than put something out that's janky. And then you're like, ooh, they should have fixed this. They should have caught this. Mm -hmm. So rather have them do it now. And also, we got to remember, this is not going to be a comedy. This is going to be a drama. So maybe the people that they brought in weren't necessarily drama people. And, you know, to get that spirit. Because, again, I think the only thing this thing is going to have in common is is going to be the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and that, that move. But everything else, how the family moves is going to be different. So I'm okay with that. Fix it now. Don't give us a product that that isn't good that you can't put your name behind. Yeah, all and right. it could be a situation like remember how a different world was. They had season one; it was all jacked up because they didn't have the right team to run it. And then when Debbie Allen came, you know, it was what it was supposed to be, which is what made it a classic. So maybe they caught it before it was before the whole world saw it and say, "Hey, this isn't what we have in mind. This isn't authentic to, to the storyline that'll take it to where we see it." So hopefully, it's a save. Um, hopefully it's a save so that they can deliver what we're expecting. Yeah, I totally hope that you're right. I think that's a really good point, Kim. Thanks for that. All right, moving on to our next topic. I actually want to talk about this topic about the Jeopardy host front runner, which is Mike Richards. And uh, everybody thinks that he's going to uh, get the job, but there's some, there's some issues because um, we found out that he uh, actually lost in court from a discrimination case because he... Uh, one of his models got uh, pregnant and he didn't rehire. Her. Do you guys care? I, I care. I care if this guy, if this is his history and the way in which he's he's out there operating. Uh, Kim, I'll start back with you. Uh, I don't have a dog in a fight, but yeah, I do care if, I mean, 
if it was my daughter, I would want to know, you know, what's what's this connection here? And, you know, in Hollywood, we always hear about, you know, something that goes on behind the scenes that we never heard of. All of a sudden it comes out. So, yeah, we don't know, need any woman getting, you know, injured behind this type of situation. So I hope they get figure figure it out what the heck is going on. Thoughts, Mercedes? Um, yeah, I find it. Well, I, I think this puts a light on a bigger issue. The fact that the U.S., you know, we don't champion women who are pregnant when they're trying to get back to work. I think you, the U.S. has the least amount of weeks that you have for maternity leave. So I think the bigger issue here is, OK, so, yeah, there's a di discrimination going on. But should he let's crucify him? Yes. But OK, let's focus now on the issue that the U.S. has with women being pregnant and, uh, and coming back to work as well, which I think is the issue. I'm glad glad you bring that up because it's, it's a it, it is an issue. It's a real important issue, and um, I it anytime I, I think it brings up the issue of having dudes running stuff too. Though uh, Katya, I agree with the ladies, but my other issue is is that we are in an era, allegedly, of accountability. So therefore, do you want someone who's been sued being the face of this legendary franchise? You brought in all these people to guest hosts, and this is what you're coming down to. Yeah. And, and and so I really do think you know Jeopardy has a very specific brand and and, and recognition, and it's never been in terms of that type of stuff uh, relished in drama. So do you want to start the next chapter dipped in drama, and? Also, you know, we know white men fail upward. So he's going to come out. He's going to give you the cut and paste apology, say he was sorry. He learned from it. And they're probably still going to give him the job. But to me, what's disappointing is he is not a television host. You literally had a parade of people, including LeVar Burton. If he doesn't get this, I would like to see them say, hey, I would like us as black people to come together and say, fuck that. Keep your show. We're going to create something brand new. And that LeVar is going to be the face of that particular thing. Yeah. Kim, I see you were down there. It looks like you had another comment. No, I agree. I mean, I think LeVar deserves his just due. He has a whole, you know, the culture is behind him. And, you know, they owe us one or two or 10 or 100. You know, he deserves <laughs> this. Spot. You know, he All deserves right. this. Spot. And like she said earlier, you know, this is another instance of where the white man makes the rules and assume that we just supposed to live in his world, but not anymore. All right, failing up. Uh, yeah, I hear you on that one, Katya. All right, so last, the last one I want to talk about in, in quick issues is this whole issue of Angela Bassett being poised to be the highest paid woman of color in broadcast TV history or whatever they're talking about. Look, I have a problem. I'm not raising no roof. I'm... I don't want to talk about the highest paid woman of color. I want to talk about equity. How does her salary stack up to all women, not to women of color? It, I, I'm not excited if she's the highest woman of color. How is she getting paid in relationship to shows that have the same kind of ratings, the shows that have the same kind of people? That's really what I'm concerned about. Uh, whoop D. That, that that's news. That's not news to me. I, I'm, I'm not excited about that. I'm going to start with you, Katya. Okay. So in terms of women in general, she's up there. Is she the highest? No. Is she getting friends money? No. But she's not only an actress on the show, she's an executive producer on her and the spinoff, The Lone Star. So she's getting additional money on the production end as well. I It's so overdue. Angela Bassett is what, 60 plus years old? You know what I mean? My issue always is, and people get mad at me, I'm like, we talk about Saucy Ronan has the same amount, who is not even 30 yet, has the same amount of Academy Award nominations as Viola Davis was 50 plus. That's the problem. And I agree with you, Reggie. I do think I'm happy for Angela, and in terms of money projection, she's up there top five. But why does it take a black woman to get into her 40s or 50s and 60s to start making the type of money that she deserves? And don't give me box office, don't give me ratings, because we know it doesn't matter with white women. Emma Emma Stone makes more money. She's not a box office champion. Uh, Sarcy makes particular type of movies, great actors. She's not a box office champion. So all that talk is baloney. And same thing with ratings. But I do think what we should be talking about this is why does it take? And Angela Bassett is 
trained Yale, all of that, a woman, a black woman to get into her fifties and sixties. And she has to wait to have a 30 year career to get money. Yeah. Mercedes. I completely agree. Not only does she have to wait this long to get the money, but she's wearing how many hats? So she's the executive producing. She's starring in the film. She's, uh, I mean, the, the show. She's created the spinoff, helped to create this. So you got to do all these different tricks, these pony tricks, just to make this amount of money. She's not just showing up and, and giving her skill as an actor and saying, give me my check like a lot of these other people are. She has to do 50 million jobs just to get you know, the, the equal pay or just, you know, breaking that, that, that ceiling that she's breaking now. So it, it's like, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Like she's getting the check, but make her work like a mule. I'm not feeling that. Wow. Kim. I would totally agree. I mean, she's making what, like 450,000 an episode, but I would say let, let's make it all public. Let's be transparent. Since you're sharing numbers, share everybody's numbers so that we really do know, you know, <laughs> is this really a win or what? And compare the apples to oranges and really make the decisions that need to be made, you know, in the executive suite, you know, and, and I think it'll, the transparency that needs to be made, uh, I think it'll cure and open the eyes of a lot of individuals from the top to the bottom in the industry period. Wow. All right. Well, that's it. That's it for that section. We're going to our, our, our next to last section, which is the big industry issue. And the issue that I really want to talk about, and this really comes out of Stillwater, it also comes out of uh, other movies that we've 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 seen uh, of of recent. And this whole issue of should real stories be off limit for creative adaptation? And because what happens is, is as we all know, is that when you get that real story out there, and you start to twist it and turn it. People don't know that it's really been twisted and, and turned, um, and 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 I think right now, as you know, that still the the young lady featured in Stillwater is having a problem. She's like, okay, you twist and turn the story, but now you have made it where everybody thinks that I'm guilty or that I did this or that I did that. So it's not just about Stillwater though; it's about other movies as well. And so the question is, and I'll start with you first, Kim is should we have these these uh, real life stories and should they be off limits for ad adaptation? I mean, sometimes it could be at the discretion of the person that it's about and how much they're willing to delve, you know, to make public of what really happened. Of course, usually when it comes on and say, it may say based upon a true story or loosely based upon a true story. So, you know, is that upon the person that this story is about, the key character, or because they're protecting other people and circumstances, or is it a creative decision to say, hey, yeah, we know that happened, but let's let's switch this. Now, that is what I have a problem with. That's not really what happened. Say, say, say more, Kim. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it always goes back, even with the Aretha Franklin situation. You know, we learned many things about people. You know, you had the, the, the Nat Geo version, and of course you have the, um, the Jennifer Hudson version. And for me, I saw it was a way more transparent, the Nat Geo version. However, the family wasn't on board with that one. But the, um, the MGM Studios ones that they produce, it was a little more, you know, it was, it still told her story, but it was really a lot softer, a lot prettier, you know, the Nat Geo went in. So may, there had to be a reason why the family did not approve the Nat Geo version and did approve the, um, the Jennifer Hudson version, but why? Whereas was what not Nat Geo said, was that information fabricated? Or did what we see with Martin Luther King and all these other people and all these other things that we learned about Aretha Franklin, as dark as it was, did this really happen? Or is this something that the family wanted cover, covered up? If it's a wound for the family and they want it covered up, I mean, hey, you can't go against what the family, what, what the estate wants. However, we as viewers, we want the real, real. We want yeah. the tea. We want to know what happened. So I think, again, it goes back to the discretion of the family and what they're comfortable with and the estate. But as a viewer, I want to know what really happened. Matthew. 
I think Kim brings up a good point. I think in, in the, the Aretha Franklin thing, I don't think the family wants her business out there. But the difference is we knew about it. Like if you were a fan of hers, you know that she had kids really early and there was something that happened. There was some abuse, there's some taking advantage of, right? Um, I think sometimes we like to sanitize our people. And if you are a, a student of history, you want the truth. Now, speaking about Stillwater, that's Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox, we don't know to this day what happened with in Italy. She was accused of killing her roommate, her and her boyfriend. Amanda Knox, to me, needs to really be quiet and live her life in obscurity because she was found guilty and then she was given clemency and she kept saying she's innocent. And I'm not going to, I wasn't there, so I can't say if she was innocent or not. But at the end of the day, there is a young woman that is dead. That young woman's family believes that Amanda did it. And for Amanda to continuously be like this, this, that, and the third, the gift that you were given as you have your life back and you're here in the United States, that family is living without their daughter. And yeah, but the two, like, but the two, but hold on, hold on, Katia, hold on for a second. But the two are not mutually exclusive. No, it's not mutually, it's not mutually exclusive that that you're absolutely right that these people are suffering and that happened. But that doesn't mean that the person's not guilty and that the person, I mean, was not, is not innocent and that the person wants can't fight and fight for themselves. You, you can't her, you can't absolve you, you can't say moment, somebody though. can't fight for themselves. You had her I, moment, it was like 10 years ago. And to me it's like if you feel like somebody violated, that's what you have the legal system for. What I feel as though she is, in my opinion, has been extremely insensitive to that family. Because if it was a black person, we wouldn't even allow, they wouldn't even allow her to say the stuff that she's saying. That's just fact. And okay. number two is Amanda, you know, there are tons of black people that have been in, sitting in prison for 30 or 40 years for something they didn't do. And you not, you have no empathy and no neither does society. So to me, it's like, if you have an issue with that, take that up with the filmmakers. Okay. All right. Well, Mercedes, jump on in here. I'm going to just say that, uh, you know, even piggybacking off what Kim was saying about Aretha, I think a lot of times families are, are always trying to uh, control the narrative, especially when their loved one is deceased and they feel like they have to present a specific image. We saw that in Nat Geo as well. Aretha was showing up to some of those interviews and trying to put on a smiley face because that's what she wanted the public to perceive her as. So her family kind of carrying that torch of how we want this to look as opposed to giving us what the real is. And sometimes the real is what's going to heal other people when they can relate. I see that also with uh, with uh, Dr. Dre when he did Straight Outta Compton. He left a lot of pivotal moments about who he is as a person, his character. Yes, you might have been a genius in music, but you were an a-hole to a lot of people and women especially. And there's a lot of things that they left out in that movie as well that could give us the real and how people and women can learn from people in the music industry. So it's a, it's a difference between trying to control the narrative and creating a falsity about somebody's character and who they are and how they present themselves. I I I, I love I love I love that point. I, I actually I love all of you guys' points on this one. I think it's uh, interesting. We've had discussions not uh, because we're we're coming up on on closing, so I won't try to get into it a lot. But when we even look at the movie the movie Zola and what was included and what was not and and so on and so forth so it's really interesting how you navigate this this whole thing of it's a true story but uh, how do i how do i tell a story maybe put some creative you know license on it but not go too far away or go go as far away as i want to go so it's really an interesting thing and i'm, I'm glad to get you guys uh, thoughts on it it seems murky uh, but uh, I, I get it and I appreciate it. With that, um, we're at our last sec segment and the last segment is our spotlight segment. And this is the segment where we just spotlight anything. It could just be for one half of a second, I, it, whatever you want to talk about. And I'm going to tell you what I want to talk about because I have Kim and Mercedes here who have not heard me talk about this before. So I'm just going to talk about it again. Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso. Look, the best thing I'm watching is Ted Lasso. I'm sorry, y'all. If you haven't watched this show, they get it right. All the characters are good. What's happening with the characters are good. They're so interesting. And if they don't win 15,000 Emmys, I'm going to be surprised. I'm gonna <laughs> 
I'm going to thank my friends, KB and Katya Woods, for just having me watch Ted Lasso. So that's my spotlight. I'm going to go to Kim. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to say, Yaya Abdul Mateen, Yaya Abdul Mateen. <laughs> <laughs> and the spirit oh, of the four brought to us. Uh, that's just what I want to highlight. I want to highlight the man, the myth, the legend. This <laughs> that Candyman is coming out, and I, that's what I'm most excited about in the next coming months. And I, I just wanted to throw that out there. That's what I want. <laughs> but that's your segment. That's your segment. That's good. So you just jump right in there. Oh, my no. God, did I miss this one? <laughs> was I asleep? It's always on the brain. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, I was only on vacation for a week. So, all right, all right, Kim, Kim, uh, what, what's your spot like, Kim? Um, one of the things I'm excited about is the reboot of the game. So, I know a lot of people who didn't watch it, but I watched it and I love it. A lot of the key characters are coming back. Um, I don't know too much about it, but I don't care. You know, the Brit Brat is coming back, and I'm just excited to see what, you know, um, what was her saying? Twerk that, tweak that, tweak that. I, I don't know. I can't even say it right. But I'm looking to see what, what Wendy Raquel Robinson is going to bring because she always brings it. So shout out to the game for coming back. And so so I, I got to ask you because you said you, you can't wait wait to see it. So you were so, sorry to see it see it go. Yes, I was I was sad to see it because it was the first look. It came back, what, in like 06 or some, some 07, somewhere around there. And so it was the first look called Life as Live a NFL Ballers play for that was reality TV of basketball wives and whatever the all the wives shows. It was before all of that, kind of sort of. I don't think Real Housewives was around yet, but specifically about that. So, you know, we got to see real storylines of when you choose, you know, you want to go to med school, but you got to choose between school and supporting your man that ain't your husband yet, but he ain't your husband. So what should you do? Ha ha. Great storyline. Let's talk about it. So it shows the dynamic between a mom and a son. You love your mom, but yo, I'm an adult now. And you're a little bit too, you know, in my business, but I need you to kind of run my business because I'm irresponsible. So it shows interracial couples. I think all the storylines was was amazing to me, in my opinion. And plus the fashion was great. And the, you, you know, the reads were great with, with Wendy, um, with Wendy Raquel, and so I'm looking forward to see what they're gonna do with it this time. Uh, well, well, excellent. I, I I will say that I'm always happy for Wendy. Uh, always happy that she she can get that paycheck. So really good. All right, Katya. Yeah, she's been around a long time, and she's still doing it. So hey. Yeah, I'm I'm always happy for her. Uh, Katya. Bring it, bring us home. What what's the spotlight? The best thing I've seen. I've been watching the Olympics. I ran track and field. Shout out to all the Latinas, specifically the Afro-Latinas that are putting their countries on their backs and handling it. I think it's so important, so great for Latin America, so great for the world to see because you know what? It's 2021 and we still have people out there that don't understand that Black people are global, that there are Black people whose first language is not English or from the continent. And these women are doing it, you know, and it's just beautiful to see the diaspora now the important thing is that some people you know are going to have to get off their discomfort and finally start talking about a lot of those themes that we have been begging to be speaking about but to see these beautiful brown faces on my television screen and just killing it it is just I mean, I particularly am thinking about Rebecca Andres, who's from Sao Paulo. She is from, she grew up in the favela, single mother, you know, like Daniela said, from a humble beginning, this girl had three ACL surgeries. If you know anything yeah. about that, it's hard yeah. to come back for one. And for her to be out there tumbling, twisting, doing her thing, and so, in, and she just dedicated her win to the country. And I, we keep saying representation matters. Uh, there's a gymnast by the name of Daniela who was the first Brazilian gymnast to win, also a Afro-Latina, to win a gold medal at a world championship. She won it for floor exercise. That was her idol. She had a visual representation of somebody that had a similar background than her that did it. And they were in a camp together. And she was like, so, and they, the older one taught the younger one. And to see the younger one win a medal and to see Daniela do the announcement and just crying, it's shears of joy. So that's why representation matters. When you can see it, 
somebody from your background, from your from your heritage, then you're like, you know what? Why not me too? And hopefully we'll get more money into the program to get other young women a chance. I cannot stress this enough as all of us, especially we have a lot of black women here today. We got to continue speaking up. We got to continue saying, hey, the reason why we need us in those spaces, number one, we earned it. Number one, we're overqualified. And number three is we got to think about the next generation. The idea is not to be the only black person in the room, period. Love it. Love it. Look, that's our show. I'm Reggie Ponder, The Real Critic. This is The Real Critic Roundtable. That's Kim Ford. I am KimFord.com. That's Mercedes Springer. Uh, she critiques. And then that is Katya Woods, and you can check her out at cupofsoulshow.com. With that, hey, this is where African-American film critics come to discuss, debate, and have some fun. We did all of that, and we'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.